current trend among happiness researchers is a lot of emphasis on meaning and on, and on a sense of purpose. Uh, that you know, just wasn't the case 10 or 15 years ago. There is a great deal of debate as to uh, the value of life satisfaction and whether this is what we're trying to maximize. I have, in the past, uh, proposed that we should put a lot of emphasis on what people experience in their daily life, which is a completely different thing from uh, life satisfaction. But if, you know, I, I think about what's been going on today, and one thing that hasn't been mentioned, and that has to do with well-being, if there is a huge asymmetry between people's responses to gains and to losses, and there is a huge asymmetry between winners and losers, and losers suffer more than winners enjoy. And so in, in this whole issue, you know, we have to think about losers. And losers fight harder than winners or potential winners. And that is where reforms in general fail, or very frequently fail, is because the potential losers fight much harder than the potential winners. And I, I would think that, at least in the short run, when we're trying to understand uh, what is going on, that thinking dynamically about losers and winners in the current change, and what are the losers going to do, and the phrase that people will rise before, machine do, before machines do. That, I think, is something that we should really focus on. The issue of what we're trying to maximize is interesting. But that leads me to another question. I'm impressed uh, that there's a lot of optimism here, uh, tempered, in, as we saw in the last session, but what we've been complaining about, what everybody has been complaining about, that this is not a decent society and, and so on, and I certainly concur, we can't be optimistic if the trend in the culture and in the politics goes the other way. What I do not understand is we have a culture that is built on on work, on the idea of work, and we have a culture that's deeply individualistic and that is against redistribution. We have a political culture. Uh, in, when we look at the trend of AI and at the political and social uh, situation, I see less reason for optimism than, uh, than was expressed today. I mean, the, you know, it's, uh, we all complain about the society, but what are we going to do? And the answer is we are not going to do anything that is going to affect that, or very little. It's society that is going to respond, and how we are going to do that is not clear. Well, I didn't answer your question, but. No, a little bit. Um, so one of the things you got the, your, your Nobel Prize for was inventing the field, understanding some of the biases in, in human decision making. Um, now machines are making more and more decisions. Um, do you see a day where we, we can and should be delegating more of our decisions to machines? Would that be a, a better world? Would that be an, a, a less biased world? Well, I mean, I think it's fairly clear in the trends that we're seeing that machines, algorithms have been better than human judgment wherever the comparison has been done uh, for a long time. I mean, there are hundreds of studies documenting that. And, and ad, actually, the algorithms don't even have to be very complicated because human judgment is typically so bad in, in complex situations. With the, what seems to be happening in AI, and that's you know, what, what fascinates me about it, is that AI is clearly doing better than the linear algorithms that have been doing better than humans. And so, uh, there is the, the potential for uh, AI making judgments better than humans. Is, I mean, that's, that is just going to happen. And it's going to happen in, in interesting places. It's going to happen in major decisions 
like, for example, major business decisions. I could imagine a module where, uh, and it's going to happen, that is going to have the ability of evaluating a merger, of evaluating an acquisition better possibly than, than people are doing. And what will that do to our structure? What will that do to leadership? What will that do to organizations is a question well, that... They're already being used, in, as we know, in, in decisions like helping with hiring decisions. Uh, uh, Bridgewire talked about it. But one of the concerns uh, um, that Ryan brought up, I think Andrew Ang listed it as one of the three big concerns, Kate Crawford has written about it, is that some of these systems end up having a lot of built-in bias um, as, as they run. Well, uh, any system that is modeled after human judgments is going to show human biases. I mean, that's, uh, that's clear. If you want to have the advantages of modeling human judgments and improving on it, but at the same time obeying certain moral constraints like no discrimination or some, mm -hmm. uh, then you have to build that in. You have to build that in as a corrective. But I, I think that, in, look, I mean, many of what we call discrimination biases, they are there in part because they are predictably valid. I mean, profiling, uh, profiling exists for a reason. It's not, uh, it, it has some elements of predictive validity. You're going to build something that is just trying to be predictive. It's going to do things that socially we are very uncomfortable with. And we'll, we'll have to sure, find a way of dealing with it. Maybe, you know, fairness and other factors can enter as well as predictive validity. But that will have to be built in if, if you're thinking of, of algorithms mm -hmm. replacing human judgment, mm -hmm. you, and you want to build fairness into them in mm -hmm. some way. Mm -hmm. And that is not going to happen by merely finding the best predictive solutions. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to impose constraints on the solution. Are you more optimistic that we can do that with machines than, we've been, than we can do uh, removing biases from humans? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm really not very optimistic about changing human nature. I don't mm -hmm. see any reason to assume mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. that human nature is going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly, with AI, there are possibilities of creating agents uh, which are different. I was going to say who, but agents <laughs> which Someday. are different from the way that that humans are, and and the possibility of designing something that is better than human judgment. That's an exciting possibility. And you seem pretty optimistic about that. Well, I mean, I I I see no reason. I see no reason to limit the the prediction about what can happen, about what can be modeled. And one, one very simple um, difference between uh, human judgment and algorithms is that algorithms are noise-free. That is, you present an algorithm with the same problem twice, you're going to get the same output. There's a huge amount of noise in human decision-making at all levels, you know, underwriters, I mean, I've been studying this problem for the last few years, just a huge amount of noise. The advantage of algorithm over humans that has been documented in those hundreds of studies is primarily because algorithms are noise-free. And now, in addition to their being noise-free, they're based on very large databases, then, then yes, uh, th there is a lot of potential. Well, we're just about out of time. I can't help but notice that you've been smiling during this entire interview. In fact, every time I see you, you're smiling. You've been studying, among other things, happiness research. Is there a causal link one way or the other there, or is it a, is it a spurious correlation? <laughs> no. <laughs> Doing happiness research has nothing to do with it. I've just been enjoying myself. This is a great day. Great. Well, we've been enjoying it very much as well. Thank you very much for spending this time with us.